following program contains scenes of sexuality, violence, coarse language, and adult themes. Because it's awesome. Viewer discretion is advised. episode 10 where we look at the question what the heck is character agency when the whole game is a toy of course this is when i give a shout out to momo who's getting comfortable and the six-sided construct with the most agency ever glowy box glowy box gets stuff done yo what's that glowy box move it along oh okay and that's basically what character agency is. A character's ability to make meaningful choices that affect the story. It's a concept people often throw around without really understanding. So before looking at the question, what the heck is character agency when the whole game is a toy, we can start simply with, what the heck is character agency in the first place? Character agency is not an indication that a character is sympathetic, likable, or knowable. It has nothing to do with knowing how a character feels about what's going on in a story. It's about the ability to make choices that matter. The easiest way to understand agency is through Star Wars. Han shot first. That's agency. Luke cutting his training short with Yoda to rejoin the fight against the Empire. That's agency. Generally, characters with a lot of agency are seen as well-developed and characters with little agency are seen as poorly developed, but there are exceptions. Frodo Baggins in The Lord of the Rings, for instance, doesn't make very many meaningful choices. He's mostly dragged along by fate, circumstance, and heredity, being literally carried over the finish line by Samwise Gamgee. But does this make Frodo a bad character? No. In Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice spends most of the story following instructions. Eat me, drink me, recite, clean cup, move down. Those who make choices in Wonderland tend to be the ones considered mad. And that was kind of the point. The seemingly unending rules of Victorian society created such a regimented lifestyle that only crazy people had any freedom. Alice essentially takes the reader through a guided tour of a very odd place that spoofs the complexities of England's proper society of the time. Once she decides to follow the White Rabbit, she's basically along for the ride. So does this make Alice a bad character? Millions of children throughout the years would say no. Main characters in dystopian stories set in totalitarian states, like George Orwell's 1984 and Kafka's The Trial, also have very little agency. That's the entire point of the story. These characters are controlled by their circumstances and oppressive governments. The whole modern idea of agency is somewhat controversial to begin with, since it's rooted in Marxist theory. Before Marx, Enlightenment thinkers like René Descartes and Immanuel Kant, I said Kant, believed that self-awareness was all that was required to have agency. It was Marx who introduced the idea that social structures could limit a self-aware person's agency, which of course means anything written before the publication of the Communist Manifesto in 1848 was written in a time with a very different idea of what made for a well-crafted story. Character agency isn't quite the same thing as this sociological concept of agency, but it's definitely influenced by the idea. Because the concept that character agency is required for good writing has Marxist roots, certain methods of literary criticism are at odds with this idea. Northrop Frye's theory of modes, for instance, offers entire categories of perfectly good literature that don't rely on character agency. Myths, in Fry's model, hinge strongly on submission to the will of the gods, meaning the will of the humans involved is of secondary concern. Since the Lord of the Rings was heavily rooted in myth, this explains Frodo Baggins. 
Even romantic literature was more about strong states of emotion. In these sorts of stories, often characters have the social power to make choices, but lack the autonomy to do so because of, say, family tensions or deeply held religious beliefs. Restrictions on a character can be interesting. While a character who doesn't make meaningful choices can be boring, characters with too much power are also boring. That's a big challenge in writing Superman. When Superman is written as so powerful that he can fly into space without needing to breathe and spins the earth backwards to turn back time, how can you give a character like that meaningful challenges? Even Fry's classification of irony doesn't require character agency. In fact, because irony required the Greek concept of pharmakos, meaning the sacrifice or exile of a human scapegoat, that scapegoat had no agency by necessity. Both the Alice in Wonderland stories and those dystopian stories fall into this category. So, to steal from Henry Ford, a requirement for agency in literature is more or less bunk. Before this starts sounding too much like a Jordan Peterson lecture though, gotta maintain my own character voice, what's the TLDR? It's basically this. Contrary to not so popular belief, character agency is not necessary for a good story. It's just a lot harder to tell a story that will hold a modern audience when nothing a character does really matters. A notable exception to this, of course, is The Handmaid's Tale. Offred can't be said to have a lot of agency to impact her world. She makes choices, but are they truly meaningful? That's up for debate because no matter what she does, she seems to end up right back in captivity. What's compelling about Offred is how she feels about her circumstances, how she wages a moral war against her oppressors, even though there isn't much in real terms that she can do about it. Her choices are limited to whether she chooses to mentally submit, and her internal monologue is her act of defiance, even if her actions against the powers that be are constantly mooted. So things are already a mess here before we introduce the critical thing that makes a video game a game, interactivity. Video games are frequently misunderstood by the media, media critics, and even academics who study video games because these critics apply concepts from mass communications or film theory to games. This ends up creating many false assumptions regarding what games do and how people interact with games precisely because tools designed for linear, non-interactive media don't acknowledge the fact that video games are games. A video game is as much a toy as a story. A novel or a TV show doesn't have to code any understandable rules for anyone else to follow. A film doesn't have to worry that the viewer expects some control over how things go. Well, other than Star Wars movies. In a video game, the playable character often starts with little relative power and few choices. The character is often thrust into the circumstances of the game instead of choosing to engage. Think about how many games begin with a plane crash or with the playable character in jail. As the game progresses, the player makes increasingly complex plot and combat choices through their control of the character as the character grows more powerful. But are those choices the players or the characters? It depends on the game. Video game agency is a delicate balancing act between the necessity of the developer setting rules to create challenge, the player's ability to make choices, and the characters themselves being developed enough to have defined personalities and therefore be interesting. And that's the subject of this week's Lady Bit. interaction between developer agency, player agency, and character agency is something I call the triangle of agency. And that triangle takes a different shape depending on various elements of the game. In an open world sandbox style game like Far Cry or Fallout, the developer places very few restrictions on a player and the playable character has only a few hardwired desires. Most of the critical choices are left up to the player. In more structured experiences like God of War or Uncharted, the characters themselves have a lot more say regarding how the action proceeds. Kratos tends to be laser focused on specific goals like spreading his wife's ashes atop the highest mountain in the realms or slaughtering as many gods as he can. Nathan Drake, on the other hand, likes to improvise, but his choices 
often terrible choices, are his at critical junctions, not the players. Then there are high concept games like the Stanley Parable or Papers, Please, that deliberately restrict both player and character choices to make some philosophical statement about fascist governments or the illusion of choice itself in video games. No matter what balance of the three types of agency are in a game, however, all of them must be present for a game to work as a game. If a player has no choices, then a game is pretty boring. Imagine a shooter with only one type of weapon available through the whole game. See? Pretty boring. If a character has no motivators, then the game seems purposeless. Even the simplest arcade games like Pac-Man are driven by the character's desire to eat dots, food items, and ghosts. Even Chell in Portal has the motivation to escape the very dangerous science tests, even though she doesn't say a word. Characters need a goal, or the player doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing. But if a developer doesn't reserve the right to restrict the players and the characters' movements, powers, and choices in some way, then a game has no difficulty, and it's boring. Game mechanics are all about a developer deciding what they're going to let the player do and not do. Whether a character can jump, swim, climb, or use a gun that turns enemies into sheep, all define the experience, create win and fail conditions, and make a game a game. If any one of these types of agency is poorly thought out, then the game will likely suffer as a result. Agency of other characters within the narrative further complicate things, since a story is traditionally driven by the choices of the main character, but other characters' choices can have impact as well. Video game villains often have a ton of agency because they're the final boss. The big bad's choices are the ones that make the playable character dance, or shoot, or run. You get the idea. Various secondary characters also make choices that inform the plot, but those are often straight up story elements and often have far less impact on how a game plays as a game. There are exceptions, like when a secondary character gives the hero a new weapon, but I don't want to bore you with these details. How is this particularly relevant to the subject of women in video games? The most popular feminist thought regarding video games is that the agency of the playable character and the main villain are what are considered important, whereas, say, a princess who is kidnapped has no agency. The metaphor is that in the game between the hero and the villain, the kidnapped princess is the ball. It's true that damsels in distress are often more plot devices than characters in and of themselves. More on that in future episodes. But that's in a story, not a game. When a game's rules and narrative interactivity enter into the mix, the balance of power changes. Suddenly, instead of the hero and the villain being characters with agency, they become game pieces in service of the player. Instead of a princess being a ball in a game between a hero and a villain, most basic video game structures mimic eight ball pool. The playable character is the cue ball that the player directly interacts with. The player then sinks various other balls with the cue ball, leaving the eight ball for last. The eight ball, of course, being the final boss. So do we expect billiard balls to have agency? No, you don't need to have character agency to have a game with rules. Now, it's true that many video games do include characters with hopes and dreams and fears. These hopes and dreams and fears just aren't required to make a good game. If you're playing a racing game, for instance, your playable character can be a car, and not the Pixar kind of car. The narrative of a video game provides an imaginative veneer over gameplay mechanics, but really, the desires of the characters in a video game are often just context to creatively explain the rules of a game. Unless a playable character's choices tell a player something about how to play a game, the choices that really matter are those of the player. For example, the Doom Marines' tendency to punch every button instead of just pressing it tells the player that the game is intended to be played aggressively. Nathan Drake's reckless decisions encourage players to take some blind leaps and explore situations that would be considered stupidly dangerous in the real world. Fulfilling a character's ultimate desire is usually the key to the victory condition of a game. 
But some iconic video game characters profoundly lack agency in that every choice they make pulls them towards a predetermined fate. Kratos is an example of this kind of character. No matter what he does, he's a one-man Ragnarok for whatever god pantheon he encounters. It was a pretty major statement in the most recent God of War game that Kratos doesn't believe in fate, because he's constantly being manipulated by everyone around him, including the player. The change in camera angle between the Greek God of War games and the latest Norse one might offer a clue that Kratos has broken the hold fate has on him, since instead of the player looking down on Kratos like a god, the player now follows Kratos at eye level like an ally. The choice to fulfill his wife's last wish is also a much more conscious choice than the raw revenge that drives Kratos in the original games. Dad Kratos? is more self-actualized than Soldier Kratos was, because his love for his son prevents him from completely succumbing to rage or grief as he had in the past. In Bioshock, a form of post-hypnotic activation means that the playable character, Jack, cannot refuse any request, including the phrase, would you kindly? This mimics the fact that in order to complete the game, the player must complete certain tasks, while other choices, such as whether to rescue or harvest the little sisters, are optional. And in Assassin's Creed, Desmond Miles is forced to recreate the actions of his ancestors through the Animus technology. He can't change the outcome, since there are events that are in the past. They've already happened. Destiny, the concept, not the game, is a popular narrative device in video games, hearkening back to Northrop Fry's classification of myth, which, as a type of story, does not require human character agency. Playable characters in video games are often born heroes, as opposed to made heroes. The playable character, the dragonborn, the child of Baal, the son or daughter of some very important person, is inherently special. Born heroes can still make choices, as Luke Skywalker does by not turning to the dark side like his father did, but characters swept up in stories of destiny have extremely limited options just by nature of that destiny. And video games often do have a predetermined destiny for the playable character, coded into the game through victory conditions. In order to beat the game, you have to complete certain predetermined challenges. Of course, Destiny is just a lofty veneer covering the rules of the game you're playing, but that's precisely my point. In order to make a game a game, there have to be rules, which inherently means a limitation of player and character agency. You can't just do anything you want. So this debate over character agency is a debate about narrative design, not game design. Again, because games come with rules and rules inherently limit agency. When you're writing a story, you set the rules as the author. When you're making a video game, however, you don't have as much control because you have to leave some decisions open for the player. And when you're playing a video game, you're at the mercy of the rules of the game. Sometimes those rules are forgiving, sometimes, they're Dark Souls. These critical differences are why writers and directors of linear media can be amazing at making movies, but terrible at making video games. A big problem in adapting video games to films, on the other hand, is that video game playable characters tend to be ciphers, which doesn't make for especially interesting movie heroes. There are, of course, exceptions to this. The Tomb Raider and Uncharted games manage to create strong, defined playable characters, but these games up until the Tomb Raider reboot, they're extremely linear, and they don't give the player a lot of choices where the narrative is concerned. Other, more open-ended games have characters that have so little agency that while they may have aspirations, they are totally reliant on the player to have those aspirations met. Some game characters don't even take a piss without you providing them with a toilet and prompting them to take said piss. I'm referring, of course, to The Sims, and the uniquely creepy dollhouse-style codependency between The Sims and the player. And that creepiness is a big reason why I hate The Sims. I hate The Sims. But The Sims gives us another form of play that shows how playable character agency isn't a critical component to game design. When a kid plays with a doll, do we expect the doll to have agency? 
Of course not. It's an inanimate object. Video game characters are essentially digital action figures, so the idea that there's an expectation that they make their own choices is somewhat misplaced. In truth, the playable characters in a lot of popular games are vaguely brainless, and we're examining that in this episode's Versus Mode. Ah, it's me! I don't gotta think! I just gotta do! Play a say run, I run! Play a say jump, I jump! And if I didn't choose to kidnap the princess, you wouldn't do any of that. But if I don't do that, what's I do? Anything you want. Oh, right. You don't actually do anything other than rescue the princess. The assumption is that the princess makes decisions ruling the kingdom, but we know nothing about you. Hi, you plum! So you fix people's toilets, that's not heroism. It's a heroic if you gotta clog the toilet! You don't do any plumbing in the actual game, so if I didn't kidnap a princess, you'd be nothing. No one would know your name. Other people's shit is the only reason you exist. You are meaningless without me. You need me. But the kidnapping is bad. Every story needs a villain, but we could do the story without you. You're interchangeable with, say, your much taller brother. It's not to the size that counts. Okay, points for that one. But my point is that a playable character's ability to make choices is just a proxy for the player's ability to make choices. In some cases, the playable character makes the fewest choices of any character in a game. Other characters say, would you kindly fetch me six thingamajigs? And the playable character does it. Don't actually do it, moron. But the fetching thingamajigs is a fun. See, we assume you think that, but no one actually asks you. You're a puppet stooge for the player, created to die over and over and over again every time the player screws up in some twisted idea of fun. I'm taking the princess. No, I must have saved the princess! Well, they got catty. What's that glowy box? Not funny? Okay, sorry, bad pun. It's been said that characters without agency are just puppets, but as Boobzer pointed out in many ways, that's exactly what playable video game characters are. Avatars that the player controls. Very few video games are driven exclusively as a result of a character's choices because the main plot is predetermined. No matter what the player or by proxy the character does, the main points of the story happen in the exact same places in the exact same way. That's not a bad thing because it provides structure that the player, through their playable character, can wander away from and then come back to. Some form of playable character agency is essential to game design, however, or you can't do anything in the game. The abilities and powers that a character has allows them to impact the game world and story in various ways. So to recap, the choices regarding player, character, and developer agency depend on what kind of game a developer is trying to make. In a survival horror game, the ability to attack enemies, force doors, or otherwise affect the game world are very limited. In a sandbox game, on the other hand, almost everything and everyone is potentially destructible. And many games, including RPGs and action-adventure games, start the playable character off as relatively weak and have them gradually gain strength and agency via special abilities and character stats as the game progresses. Sometimes a game is made in service of a specific story, like Life is Strange or Gone Home, and sometimes that gets to the point that the gameplay elements are so secondary that some players claim these games aren't games at all. Other games, like Far Cry and Elder Scrolls games, make the main story far less relevant to what a player gets out of the game. In these games, the gameplay itself is the most critical part of the story. Other games, like Minecraft, Ark, The Sims, and RimWorld, 
have very little set story and leave it up to the player to create their own narrative. And some games do allow player choices to directly impact the plot. The Mass Effect games allow player choices to alter who lives and who dies at critical moments. The Dragon Age games have ongoing plot points that hinge on player choice that carry over from game to game. Some games, again Far Cry is an example of this, have hidden endings that reward the player for not thoughtlessly following in-game instructions. But most games don't do this, and this doesn't make them bad games. The Uncharted games follow the Indiana Jones tradition, so no matter what Drake does, he can't, say, stop Shambhala from crumbling around him at the end of Uncharted 2. In games with heavy difficulty, story can be almost irrelevant. The game setting sets the mood and tone of the game, but little else, because the fun comes from getting your ass kicked. What can I say? Gamers are masochists. So, to answer the central question of what is character agency when the whole game is an abstract toy? One could claim that character agency is just one of many mechanics at play in a game. Because games aren't books or TV shows or movies. Games are inherently unfinished until the player plays them. But what is finished is this episode. Except for this week's trophy. And I can get up now because Momo just gave me back my agency. Trophy time! So this one's really literal, like as in literally literal, not the millennial figurative literal. It's a ball to remind us all that video game characters are all kind of like balls. And to quote Persona, I love them balls. Okay, make that dirty onto the shelf. That's it, episode 10 done. Like what you see, donations are appreciated and monthly Patreon backers get access to a special backers only episode. And of course, please share this show on your social media. Next time, we're going to look at a topic guaranteed to piss some people off. Is misogyny in video games always bad? Ooh, until next time, I'm Leanna Kersner. Thanks for letting me show you my lady bits. Okay, Momo, I gotta move. <laughs> this is gonna take a while. I lack agency. <laughs>